Welcome to Recording 3. I'd like to take the opportunity to offer another workshop for you. It's fascinating and I think that I was caught very off guard when I first started talking to Laurie Maves. I'd never heard of an art therapist before and I find it very fascinating and I'm sure quite helpful. So she does have a master's in art therapy and she's offering what she calls Be Free, Freedom with a Brush. This is what I'm trying to learn to do as I learn to paint myself. And I know that Laurie Maves is going to help me a tremendous amount. I think you will enjoy this workshop. My name is Lori Maves Guyami and I am an artist and an art therapist and I live and work in Sarasota, Florida. And it's been an interesting year to join the group because we haven't been able to do much together, but I'm um, very honored to be, I was asked to um, submit a workshop for the conference. So if I were to give you a brief introduction of who I am as a, always as an artist and then how I became an art therapist and the schooling that you kind of have to go through to, to do that. And then um, I know how I eventually came to Sarasota, Florida, Florida, and I developed a Be Free large scale abstract painting class and how I think that is a class that could apply to anybody across the board. Um, I talk about the health and healing of that and you don't have to even be an artist to participate in it. But in general, the goal of my presentation is to educate you all a little bit about art therapy if you've never heard of it or you haven't seen it practice and um, to talk about the ranges of it and what it can do for for individuals and um, how I basically use it and offer it to the general public <laughs> okay so um, so how did I come to art therapy and sometimes people want to know well, how did you come to be an artist well I came to um, art at a very young age. It was something I was always doing as a child. I remember it was one of the most favorite parts that of going to kindergarten was standing at a small little easel and painting. That story obviously is not unique and happens to a lot of us who are artists and, and fine artists and um, creatives is that it's something that's inherently in us um, our entire lives and some of us um, are able and wanting to pursue that creative joy that's in us and so we become artists and writers and singers and dancers and but as I grew up and was always active in art and making art and making all kinds of artsy things uh, it came time to go to college and I really didn't know what to do with that I did not want to be an art educator who I wanted to study art I wanted to be an artist but there was nobody in the um, late 80s early 90s kind of helping you through the ranks of being an artist without getting your MFA and become a professor somewhere and I went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison and I'd taken a whole bunch of art classes and I was ready to get my Bachelor of Science in art and in that last semester, I found this class in the art education department that was called Introduction to Art Therapy. And never heard of art therapy before, didn't know much about it. And I thought, wow, this class sounds interesting and I needed a credit in that department. So I went ahead and enrolled in that class. I knew in that class that that was something I wanted to pursue as a professional. Using art to help people is really what sung to me, it seemed to just be something I really wanted to pursue and it made sense. So I um, enrolled in a program at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and um, they had a master's, Master of Arts in Art Therapy at the time and that was in the late 1990s. And um, I wrote some things down specifically for people who had more questions about well, what do I need to become an art therapist? And specifically, you do need a master's in art therapy to consider yourself an art therapist. Um, some people will say they're practicing art therapy and there's all kinds of debates and arguments and discussions about what officially is art therapy. So art therapy is, um, I always see it as a gamut. You can create something and have it cycle, have the product analyzed from a psychological point of view. You can psychiatrically, you can psychoanalyze, you can you can psychobabble, whatever, the product that is created. 
So you make something, some kind of visual item, and you, and you psychoanalyze it. To the other end of the gamut, where just the creative process in itself is therapeutic. And that has always been something I've gravitated to because I know myself that when I make something, when I sit down and I'm creative, it doesn't matter what it is, but the, the process of making something in itself is considered therapeutic. And so that's the gamut of art therapy from you make a product and you psychoanalyze it with the therapist. And then all the way to this side is that just the process of creating itself is therapeutic. And so there are also therapists on this gamut who just set up a studio or set up a safe environment to make something. And the process of creating is therapeutic in itself. And again, that's the kind of end of the gamut that I've always followed. And it's always made the most sense to me is the process of creating, which allows us to be free in who we are. It allows us a freedom of communication. It leaves, allows us a freedom of expression and many other things, which I'm going to come back to later. But let me just read this to you. This is from the American Art Therapy Association's website. What kind of education do I need to become an art therapist? A master's degree is necessary for entry-level practice in art therapy. The educational standards require graduate-level coursework that includes training in the creative process, psychological development, group therapy, art therapy assessment, psychodiagnostics, research methods, and multicultural diversity competence. Students must also complete at the minimum 100 hours of supervised practicum and 600 hours of supervised art therapy clinical internship. In addition, preparatory training in studio art, drawing, painting, clay, etc., and foundational areas of study in psychology are required in advance of, gen of graduate studies. The art therapy graduate curriculum is uniquely guided by the premise that focused art making constitutes reflective practice and facilitates learning. It helps to have experience as an art educator as well for teaching, engaging others, setting up a studio or classroom, learning about materials um, and extensive yeah, learning about materials and what kinds of projects work well together, about the difference between offering clay versus offering painting versus offering drawing to different sites of populations whoever's going to be working with an art therapist can participate in art therapy. Anyone. <laughs> That's the greatest thing about it. Anyone can participate in some form of art therapy. Anybody who is open to it, anybody who is interested in it, the creative process and the practice of art, the process of art therapy is that I've always enjoyed is that's the beautiful thing about it is that it can work for anyone. <laughs> work. Art therapy can really work for anyone, which I have seen. And let me comment on what those populations that I've worked with. So when I got out of grad school, I was living in Chicago, I moved to Denver, Colorado. And at the time in the late 90s, 1990s, um, art therapy wasn't well known in the state of Colorado. In general, it wasn't really well accepted. So I got my first job as an activities director and worked in a nursing home. And they were very supportive. The, the administration was very supportive of me developing programs for the residents of the nursing home. I found ways that just sitting around with the population, most of the elderly that I was working with, I could find ways that I could develop projects where sitting with them and being creative by um, reminiscing, by doing some collage projects, by working with their hands, to um, simple watercolor projects that the residents who came, they loved the process of creating and making something and painting. And I noticed a lot of time with watercolors, there was a lot of reminiscing that happened. So it was very helpful and, and positive for them, an activity that could come. And so they weren't, you know, a lot of them didn't have a lot of visitors and whatever. So nursing homes, great place to use it. After that job, I ended up working at the Mental Health Corporation of Denver, and I worked on a early child mental health um, therapy team, and I was one of about six or seven other therapists. There was a music therapist, there was a dance and movement therapist, and, and licensed clinical social workers, and uh, master's level counselors. So these were children that were diagnosed very early ages of having multiple mental health issues. Most of them I remember being PTSD related, um, but it was uh, honestly a really heartbreaking um, 
population for me to work with in particular going from the elderly to this very young population and again when we would have groups I would make groups and um, we would sit around and we could use crayons we could do collage we could use some paint but and I had individual clients there as well but for children, what's wonderful about art therapy is it, became, it becomes a method of communication. So when something happens to somebody, again, it could be a child, it can be anyone up to a, a senior, your entire lifespan, we don't always have words to communicate what is going on with us or what makes us upset. And the art, a lot of times, can become a very safe space and place and making something can encompass all of that without having to try to find specific words all the time to explain what our feelings are because even for the most eloquent people that can be a very difficult task. Center at Denver Health um, had, a, had a cancer um, outpatient program and so people who were receiving chemotherapy or um, they were receiving other treatments this was a free program for the um, for the patients to come and we would sit basically at a large uh, round table we really didn't even have that much space but um, the different patients that were in in the in the cancer program receiving chemotherapy and treatment they would come to group and we would have group once a week and things in that group was again we would do very simple things we would paint hearts we would collage we would make um, we would make things around the holidays um, we would paint we would draw we would do some creative writing but a lot of those um, participants would would say that their favorite part of of having cancer was coming to that program these people felt the healing nature of of making things and being creative and being supportive in a safe environment while while creating and what the making of objects do helps take their mind off the moment that they might have cancer, that their cancer's back, that they're not doing well, that they're not feeling well. In the moments of creating, they would feel a sense of relief, a sense of release, um, a sense of community, that they were coming into this group and they didn't have to talk about their cancer. We rarely talked about their cancer. They could just come and be together in a creative community making things together and having support and we would provide materials and things like that. It really is unlimited. There are veterans programs, um, anyone who's been in um, specific um, traumatic situations, a lot of times art can be very helpful with that. I've worked with uh, rape and abuse survivors. I've worked with young children that are um, adolescents that are, are survivors of all kinds of horrific things. Having said all of that, the fact that art can help all these people and all these kinds of populations, again, brings me always back to that the art making itself is therapeutic. And that is a very key tool in our kind of life toolbox about how, what, what are things that we need? What are things that we can use in our life when, when we need to de-stress? when we're having a difficult time or what's something we can use in our life when we just want to want to do something try something new so since 1997 i've been practicing art therapy as well as maintaining my own small business as a professional artist and that's my business i call Lori maves art it's not very <laughs> that's what it is and that's what it's been for the last 25 years it's my small business and I've always combined either working as an art therapist in, in, um, in a larger facility or working in private practice um, or um, and combining that with, uh, with teaching part-time and also creating my own art, creating my own paintings, working in, um, as a professional artist, making work, making commission work. I did a lot of work as a live performance painter in Denver. Um, so even though I went to school right out of, I went to get my bachelor's and then I went right back to get my master's, is that I always really kind of not struggled, but trying to balance um, being an art therapist and being an artist myself, because art was always creating art, was always very healing for me. And so I noticed whenever I got into a series of jobs or um, work, I worked in a lot of nonprofits um, and the more time I spent as an art therapist, the less time I was able to spend as a as a working artist. 
and working on my own creative process. And so um, over the last 25 years, I found a nice balance for that, where it's a kind of a combination of some art therapy for me. And at this point in my career, I'm doing much more art making. I do large scale um, abstracts at this point. So I received my master's in 19. 97 from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and I was I grew up in uh, rural northwestern Illinois I was not necessarily a fan of living in the city of Chicago so I left Chicago in um, 1990 fall of 1997 and moved to Denver and I was working in Denver Colorado as an art therapist and artist in different nonprofits for the next 20 years spring of 2017 my husband Ralph Guillaume and I moved to Sarasota. Kind of went through a couple different studios trying to find a place to land. And uh, I was encouraged to come to a workshop put on by Bernd Hausmann, who is a German artist living and working in the United States. And he, ran, he offered a large scale intuitive abstract painting workshop. And I, someone, I, someone I met had, was putting this on and, and she was like, you gotta come, it's gonna be great. And I went, there were four women there Two women were pretty much traditional painters, and there was one other woman who was from out of town, and she was she was from Fort Myers, and there was me who had just moved here, and I hadn't I hadn't had a bunch of experience in abstract painting, but I knew I enjoyed it. For me, it was always kind of a puzzle, and I wanted to figure it out, and um, so spent some time on my own before 2017 trying to figure out what abstract painting meant to me it was kind of this again this giant puzzle that i didn't understand and i look at abstract art and i didn't get it and i always was trying to like figure out what that means what does it mean and um so i went to this workshop in february of 2018 with with mr hausman with burned and it blew my mind totally and completely he ran this workshop for the four of us and he talk to us a lot about why we were painting, what we were painting, what was our process of painting. When we were working on paintings, were we overworking them? Maybe we should have stopped five minutes ago. Maybe we should have stopped five years ago on a certain painting. And talked with about being with the painting in the moment and enjoying the creative process at the moment. But I find this a very important part in the balance and off balance Balance should never be this. Balance should be like this. Always a little off. Always negotiating for the truth. Never feeling too safe. All these things are happening in this piece, and that's amazing. Let's see where it, where you go tomorrow. Like I was saying, I work. I uh, overwork. I I don't know, but I I already take them to a place that gets me totally crazy and anxiety and I hate it and then I would dig myself out of the hole and I'd rather learn how to paint less so that it mm -hmm. retains a certain quality that I traditionally work so hard to get to and I, I go I took photos of the whole process and so I go back to that first one that I thought was really it was dark for me which felt too heavy but I go back and look at it, and I'm like, oh, that was a great painting. I should have just stopped. <laughs> but that's okay. Right, right. But so that's okay. Suffering is optional. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. No, but no, that. we've talked about that because that. artists are supposed to suffer and they're supposed to be love. And I hate the, the, the. Uh. No, we don't have to. It doesn't and, have to be. What do we say? And? Yes, and. Yes, yes and. and. Yes, yes and. and. Thank you. Yes. Me, ding, 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 it went off in my head. I wanted to provide this for people, but kind of in a way, in a way that people can come into a painting studio, just like they do in, in paint ceramics class, or, but you can come into my workshop and I provide all the materials and it's called, I've developed this Be Free class, where for three hours, you pay a certain fee, you show up, you don't need to bring any materials. And you would provide a canvas at the wall, um, usually it's canvas stapled to the wall, and I had a studio specifically set up for that. And all kinds of painting materials, generally acrylic, all kinds of brushes and mark making tools and drawing tools, and just a wide variety assortment of the creative painting materials that I like to work with as a large scale painter. And 
they would paint for three hours. Sometimes we'd work for an hour and a half, take a break in the middle. Everyone would kind of go around and talk about what was happening with their painting and how they were feeling about it. Paintings didn't have to be about anything. They could be about color. They could be about a feeling. They could be about a specific idea. Some people wanted to paint florals. Some people wanted to paint animals. You could paint whatever you want. It was a free, th free themed, large scale abstract painting class. And it really started to take hold. I used I, my classes became more and more popular. And really what I saw what I was doing was providing an art therapeutic experience without it being therapy, because we weren't doing therapy. And I wanted to be very clear with that. I was always clear about that from with the people from the beginning. If people wanted to hire me and see me as a as their therapist, we could set that up. But my Be Free class was just to introduce how good it feels to paint and to paint large scale in a format that is safe and in a, in a place where you can you can throw paint around and and in a place to learn what create your creativity means to you don't and the great thing about having me abstract was there was no judgment and there was no level of expertise that anybody needed to have you could just come and you could paint and you could play like I did back in kindergarten at the easel and how great that feels and how freeing that can feel. And But the bottom line was for people to enjoy the process of being creative and the process of large scale painting and specifically large scale painting as opposed to any other kind of painting is because you use your whole body standing at the wall and you can use all kinds of movements. And, and so not only is it you know freeing of your mind it does some body movements for you too so at this point i want to um put a clip in i had chip brewster come in to my studio he's a he's one of those kind of personality um interviewers that works for um tampa fox 13 and he came to the studio where i was offering my big free classes in sarasota florida and he did a um a little promo for my class and so let me show you that right now good afternoon everybody i'm chip brewster coming to you live from sarasota specifically inside the studios of the 11th orange which we should really begin Lori. that is the closest intersection is that right that's 11th and orange 11th and orange yep. so now you know how to find this place as well and how to find Lori maves you're the woman behind the 11th orange let's start with a little bit of your own art history gotcha. because you started this when but you started art when yeah i started the 11th orange in march of 2019 so it's really super brand new yeah um, I started painting when I was a small child and then I went to school for art and then I got a master's in art therapy so I've been an artist and art therapist for basically my whole life cool so and, and then you ended up moving down here and, and continuing your own art whatever career yes. as it would yeah, be absolutely so when we moved here um, I had a couple different studios and I've always had a studio as a painter okay. um, and I've always worked as places an art therapist so when um, this place came available it was a perfect place for me to offer expressive arts classes oh. um, giant abstract painting classes where I could use it as my own studio as a place where I can come paint yeah but it's also provides a great place for people to come learn about painting if they've never painted before it's got this large open format for that so it's kind of a nice marriage of my history of being an artist and also being an art cool. therapist. So like what we're looking at, that's a piece of your art. Yes, the large stuff is, is mostly my large scale abstract works. But then as we walk around, we're seeing other students of yours. Yes. So let's talk a bit more about that class, though, the Be Free class, yes. which is really the... I don't know, the piece de resistance for me. Yeah. It's, I think it's kind of your, your signature at this point. Certainly, I haven't seen anything like it anywhere else. Yeah. Well, I established this class after doing a couple of other um, kind of um, product-based classes, and I wanted to establish classes the way I like to paint, which is free and um, non-product oriented. So mm. I offer these process-oriented, large-scale, free-themed, abstract painting classes where people can come, and they can be as free as they want to be, I say a lot. They can paint whenever <laughs> they want. And I help and guide them through the process, but it doesn't ever have to be about the product. Our lives are so product-driven, product-oriented. Yeah. Everyone's got to make a product in the Western world. Yeah, yeah. So this is really more about stress reduction and just learning new skill sets and and um, and offering a different way for people to to discover what painting is for them. So is it, is it kind of like that, that cliche of it's not where you end up, it's the journey that you took to get there? Yes. Like it's not? It is that cliche. Yeah, it is totally. But it, it makes a lot of sense just this is an art form as opposed to the, the journey of life. Like yes. how you create your art is what this is about. 
Absolutely. Not what the art that you're actually creating is. Exactly. And, and most of these students will tell, if you have time to talk to any of the students, they come because they get to learn about the process of painting. They come about the exploratory process, the things they learn about themselves, the parallels mm. you find in your own lives about Ooh. painting and, and, and how you approach your painting. There's so many things that are very similar. And we talk about that. We work on that. Um, it goes from, I can offer very specific art therapy to this is more like their their um, painting is therapeutic in, in nature by well, itself. Well, I'm excited to, to try some of this therapy yeah, myself I can't because wait. that's got right. We've got the canvas set up, and so in our next segment, Lori's going to start walking me through as if I was a new student in one of those classes. So hopefully anyone out there that has some interest, you get to experience along with me what it would be like if you yourself came to the 11th Orange. So, so that, class, that, that clip is a great way to show. I've got one other clip here if we want to show that. This is from um, sometimes when I have families that will come to me and say, hey, Lori, I want to do a family paint day or a... Um, I want to have family and friends get together. And so there's some pictures here in YouTube I just want to share with you quickly. It shows you different families working together in the studio. And I want you to notice I always love the smiles on their faces. Those are great. Those are those are great memories for me. Um, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, people stopped coming um, in you know March or March of 2020. And I did the best I could. I had a couple individuals from time to time come, but um, you know people just weren't out and about last year. And so by August of 2020, I made the decision to close my studio. Um, all my students that would come for my B3 classes would pay for my studio and they weren't coming. So it didn't financially make sense to leave that studio open. So right now I've landed in a really good and beautiful new place. One of my students who, um, there were a wide variety of students that would come to my B3 classes. I had people again that hadn't painted since kindergarten. I had professional painters, I had seasoned artists, and I had people who really didn't learn about painting until they came to my class who wanted to try their hand at painting. A very, um, very interesting man. A very, he's got a high level, high, high level interior design business, and he's a complete and total professional, amazing man. And he has this wonderful large interior design business in Sarasota, and he was one of my students, he knew I had closed my studio. So he invited me to come paint in the back of his studio, maybe that I could be around um, 
some other creative people and he would see he's, he's got a team of 20 some designers and different creative people and he liked the idea of having an artist in the back of the warehouse and maybe we could you know maybe we could feed off each other creatively and it could help me be in a creative environment and would help his staff as well so he invited me to come join him in the back of the warehouse kind of temporarily temporarily at first and we found out that partnership worked really well so now I am kind of loosely the in-house artist for JKL Design, and that allows me to make large-scale contemporary abstract works for any of their clientele. Um, I still am able to teach a couple of students from time to time um, in that space. I just don't have as large a space as I used to have. If we, we, if we want to visit Lori Maeve's art and Lori Maeve's the artist large-scale abstract, after I took that workshop with Burned, my large-scale abstract painting, painting totally blew wide open and I approached painting in a very new and fresh way. I never wanted to make the same painting twice. Um, I looked forward to working with materials that I, that I that I didn't gravitate to and I just kept pushing the envelope with these paintings. Um, they've become very popular and I have done very well with them. And thank you also to Kurt at JKL. He's selling a number of these large scale contemporary paintings of mine. And even Sarasota Memorial Hospital this last uh, year um, selected a couple of my paintings for their permit collection for their new hospital in Venice, Florida. So that I'm very honored to to be a part of. Right. So right now I do have this, again, this balance between making my own large scale work again, which does, when I approach painting, I don't usually have a plan. I don't want a plan. I want the, the making of these large pieces to be, to be immersive and to be therapeutic and for me just to go and have meditative kind of personal healing time, personal spiritual time. A lot of times I'll put music on and, and just try not to talk to anyone for, uh, you know, from 20 minutes to two or three hours at a time and just see what what comes and I've made paintings um, in 2020 I made paintings about um, prayers going up and there was a series of paintings about prayers and how paintings could be ma making a painting as a meditative process could those be offered as prayers and those paintings are going to be in a show at the Tennessee Valley um, Tennessee Valley Valley Art Association they're going to be showing there in August I'm going to ship the paintings up there and um, but you can look through my website here some a lot of my images that are large scale intuitive abstracts and all that means is that I, I approach the canvas and I let the canvas speak to me and I try not to have a plan I try to be open I try to be free I try to release all and any any and all judgment while I'm working on my own work and trying to always see it from a different point of right. view and I guess some questions I wanted to leave you with was why do you paint or create why do you write why do we dance? Why do we express ourselves? And some of us do that for our jobs. Some of us do that because we want to complete a task or complete a goal. But I want to communicate to you that being creative is essentially and intuitively the health of who we are. So in your making and writing and creating, and if you feel that, that when our creative processes as professional creatives, it becomes heavy on us. There's something that's not clicking and you're not connecting to that, that intuitive and authentic part of yourself. Um, so I often encourage people to release, be free, and try some large scale abstract painting. If you're working on a project and you're really struggling with it, that process can help open and free you to other thought patterns and other thought processes. That's always an interesting question. Why? And people ask me that. Why do I paint? And I paint to feel better most times. I mean, I'm, I'm hired to make paintings. And of course, why do I paint when I'm making commission paintings or I'm making paintings for work or, or for the interior designers? Um, I'm painting for work. But there comes a time where I just need to paint to feel better. And that's, that's what it does for me. It allows me to express thoughts, feelings. It, it connects me to a greater spirituality for myself. And um, that's one of the main reasons why I paint. And so I like to invite you to ask yourself the questions. Why do you paint if you're a painter? Why do you write if you're a writer? And if the answer is concerning or you don't really know the reason why, I don't have the answer for you. <laughs> you do somewhere. 
deep inside you. That's what always, that's the one thing I want to nix out as an art therapist. A lot of times people will say, I made this. What does it mean? I made this picture or my daughter made this picture. What does it mean? Now, I'm sure there are art therapists out there that will tell you that. I have never been the art therapist that will say that. What we can do in that situation is you make this. What does it mean to you? What does it look like to you? And I was always that person who just asked the questions. When I saw something, I just asked the questions. Does it mean I know what that means? The only thing I know what it means for me are it's my own work. And even then, when I make these paintings, I don't necessarily know what they mean until I sit with them much later. I think art is always a wonderful way to almost be, be almost like a future, what's a future teller? Someone who tells the future. And um, my art has done that over the years for sure. While well, I'm painting a bunch of things and I don't really know what I'm painting about specifically. And then I go back and look at it and go, oh yeah, this was about that or oh yeah that was about my dad's cancer or yeah this was about the breakup and the, my divorce and, and and that's how art has always been that kind of storyteller for me so again what is why do you paint and why do you create that's a question to ask yourself and one other thing is how do you do it the right way and so once you know why you're doing what you're doing how do you know you're doing it the right way and that was another thing that I was always very important to me in my teachings in my b free class is there is no wrong or right way to approach painting. There's a safe way to approach painting. I mean, you don't want to eat your paint, but um, there's a safe way to approach, you know, working with materials and things like that. But there's no wrong way to paint and there's no right way to paint in my classes. Anyway, I'm sure there's lots of really traditional, um, a lot of traditional artists out there and fine artists and they will tell you there are specific ways to lay paint on that canvas and you may only do the composition of threes and you may only work from dark to light and you all uh, listen there's a time and place for all of that but in um, the way I like to work and in my studio and in my teaching is that you have to take the judgment out of it there is no right way to express yourself there's no wrong way to express yourself. There just is the way to express yourself. Again, let me reiterate. The only wrong way about expressing yourself is if it's causing harm or damage to someone, to yourself or to someone else. But if you're expressing yourself, that's the health of who we are. And art is a, a great big part of that. So when you're spending some time being creative, I want you also to think about that, that there is no right way to be creative. Take that judgment off. Take the need to have a product off your plate and just enjoy the process of creating and find how that being free in your creativity allows for stress reduction, allows for some personal insight, uh, might allow you for problem solving in your life. Um, art can be this freeing thing for us. It can be a vehicle. It can be a vessel. Taking the judgment out and the expe expectations out of your art making. And the pressure out, take the pressure out of creating a product. Working in this way can be very helpful for a seasoned artist or a complete novice. That's it. I hope you enjoyed my presentation in my different videos and there'll be um, links at the end to show you where you can see my work on lauriemavesart.com where you can get some more information about art therapy from the american art therapy association from the florida art therapy association and i might throw in a couple extra video links in there for your enjoyment thank you guys for your time today and i really hope you enjoyed this presentation thank you god bless Well, if there's one thing that certainly is true, it is the saying, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And this goes so far with a branch collaboration all the way back a few months after the very beginning of the pandemic in 2020. Not only did they put their heads together and bring together all of this art, I'm going to bring it to you this evening because I thought it was so, so very important. Not only is it beautiful, but it is 
It is ultimately survival at its best. This is what pen women are made of. We are made to survive and we are made to thrive. And this is a beautiful example. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Florida Pen Women Interbranch Collaboration Project. Uh, my name is Barbara Dunham. I'm president of the Pensacola Branch of Pen Women and the coordinator for this project. With your permission, I'd like to provide a bit of the backstory for this project. Very soon after joining Pen Women, I had the pleasure of collaborating with writer Pat Gould in a branch project. I had no experience doing this, but as a new member, I was up for the challenge, and so was Pat. My art and her short story were presented at the Pensacola Branch's 75th celebration. And we went on to present it at the 2018 Florida State Biennial. If the 2020 National Biennial had been held, Pat and I were on the program for that to again make our presentation for our national members. Because I had found this previous collaboration experience so rewarding, I conceived the idea of an interbranch project to connect our writers and artists statewide, a project which would result in creating new work, as well as strengthening bonds among Florida pen women. Initially, we had 11 teams consisting of one writer and one artist each, 22 people total. I am very proud that seven of those original 11 teams are here today. Congratulations to all of you for such splendid work. And now I would like to turn the program over to our Zoom host, Carla Sorensen. Thank you. The next slide you will see, uh, Team One is, consists of Kathy Rayburn and Marianne Miller. Kathy is unable to join us today. So Karen Morris will read an excerpt from her story titled, Pink Paris. Karen. This story is about a young man recently graduated from Yale in 1881, who was just arriving in Paris on a grand tour of Europe, a graduation gift from his parents. In Paris. As I left the Paris train station full of grit and dirt with filthy walls and floors, I was surprised when I turned a corner and walked into Paris. It was pink, glowing pink rose marble. I asked a man walking by what happened to the walls. He replied that the last year had been spent scrubbing the walls of the whole city. No one alive knew the marble wasn't white, but pink. There were artists painting all over the city using the special light. I asked who was the most famous. They all replied Renoir. One agreed to take me to him, but he was wrong. He took me to the artist Monet. I asked him about the pink light. It is wonderful, just wonderful, this Paris light. Here, I will take you to lunch and you will meet Renoir. As we walked, Monet regaled me with facts about Renoir. His father was a tailor, his mother a seamstress. His family had no idea he would lead the Impressionist movement as he lived in Limoges and was hired as a painter in one of the town's porcelain factories. Wealthy patrons coming to view the Limoges China noticed his steady hand and hired him to paint fans and other luxury objects. I myself first met Renoir when he came to visit the Louvre to study the work of the French Rococo masters and the romantic painter Delacroix. All of us painters wanted to become members of the French Salon. During the summer of 1869, we spent months painting at La Grenière, where we developed our broad brush strokes to capture the water's natural movement and reflective light. In 1874, we planned our own Impressionist show. I sold most of my paintings. Poor Renoir sold few paintings, but gained many commissions to paint portraits to support his wife and three sons. Well, here we are. Renoir, this is Frederick from New York who values your work. Monsieur Renoir, how do you use so few lines and still create the form of a man with character? Well, Frederick, I just removed lines until I got what I wanted. The artists of the prior century painted lifelike portraits with each fold of lace defined. I found I could paint actions like ballet and still paint the girls simply. 
I toured Spain, Holland, and Italy. I will never forget that gorgeous pink light of Paris. Thank you. And now here's Kathy's partner, Mary Ann Miller. Hi, I'm Mary Ann Miller. Um, I'm from the Jacksonville branch in, uh, in arts and letters. In Kathy's story, her character goes to Paris and meets Renoir. My painting, which is three-dimensional, is a picture of Maison Fournay's where Renoir painted Luncheon of the Boating Party, loosely shown in the background of my painting. I was there for lunch two years ago and I felt his spirit in that place. I have shown Renoir reading a French newspaper about his painting, which I have pictured in it. I called it Renoir after the luncheon. My 3D paintings are done in layers and I enjoy figuring out how much to put in each one. I also enjoy finding little minis that I can use such as the pencils and the bread on the table. And this is, um, this is a sketch of uh, when I was there. I don't know if you can see it. This is a picture of his painting, Luncheon of the Boating Party. And this was my sketch of where we were. And um, so I just translated that into this 3D picture. I've done a series of them. I've done, um, in fact, one I thought Kathy might want to use was uh, painting in Monet's garden. I didn't know if her character was going to end up staying in Paris or uh, going back to law school. So um, this has been fun. Thank you. Team three will present next, starting with Marion Cost. Hi, I'm Marion Cost with the Cape Canaveral branch and my um, designation is Letters. I worked with Mimi and we decided at the beginning that we would go into this kind of cold and blind, not knowing anything about each other's work or what it represented. Uh, Mimi sent me four paintings to look at and her work is absolutely stunning. And I found that one painting just spoke to me. Um, when you see the painting, you'll see, I hope, what the inspiration for the poem was. A few years ago, my uh, husband's younger brother died suddenly. And he and his sister, my husband and his sister, went to the beach to spread his ashes because Tom loved the beach and the ocean. And so I wrote goodbye. It's sunset by the time we get to the beach. Long fingers of shadow follows us across the dunes. The shore is empty, all the daytime beach goers gone. Marty holds the box as we kick our shoes off on the sand and walk toward the edge of the ocean. Warm air, damp and salty, wraps around us. The last rays of sunlight gleam golden rose on the surface of the water. Both of us are silent, remembering other walks across the sand with his footprints beside ours. Early morning searches for turtle nests, hot, sandy, salty afternoons heading for a swim, late afternoon strolls before cocktails on the porch. His dog Murphy is with us, black feathery tail wagging, happy to be on the beach again, barking and lunging at seabirds that glide just above his head. We stop and let the warm waves swirl around our ankles. Marty lifts the lid and tips the box. Gray ashes drift out. A sudden breeze catches them and a dust devil dances on the water for a minute. Then the ashes settle, sliding with the wave back into the timeless sea. And my partner is Mimi Pierce. I'm Mimi Sherman Pierce. I'm a member of the Jacksonville branch of uh, NLAPW. I'm in arts. And so I was truly bowled over when I received the poem from Marion. Um, it was so much fun because we didn't know anything about each other or she knew nothing about my painting. And then I found out what it was that she saw in the painting. And my mantra has always been, art has the power to calm, to transport and to heal the spirit. And 
So I felt like maybe this had been, you know, this had accomplished what I had hoped it would do. And I liked the idea of um, not really having any prior knowledge about e each other. I thought that was exciting. I like serendipity. And um, so I, I really enjoyed the process. I highly recommend it to all. Team four yes. uh, with Claire Massey and Mary Dahl. Claire. Hello, my name is Claire Massey. I'm with the Pensacola branch and I will be reading my poem, Coronasphere. This poem was originally published in Persimmon Tree Literary Magazine and later in the Pen Women Magazine. At the time I began thinking about the poem, we were being bombarded with images of the coronavirus structure. They look like sticky balls or golf balls with tentacles or little planets unto themselves floating in space. I began to think of other phenomena in nature that were associated with coronas or rings of light and how beautiful and benign they were and the poem began to come together. When you look at Mary Dahl's painting, look at her rings of light that surround the narrator of the poem. She has painted a beautiful, poignant corona. And now I'll read the poem, Coronasphere. The Adirondack chair envelops me realigns me at the center of my backyard coronasphere. No electron micrograph, false colored sticky ball image of virus here, where coronas emit holy rays. And hues are real, though the spectrum narrows, squeezed by the limits of human perception, saturated mainly by human imagination. Fog droplets cling to Catawba trees, haloed with auras of resurrection green. They breathe with respirations deep, slow. The neighbor's daughter bands her forehead with a garland of clover. A month ago, she showed off new molars, crowns of celestial white, erupting from rosy craters. Now she's banned from coming over. Petals of sunflowers shoulder together, seeded nuclei circled, sheltered, till the cold spell passes. The trickster evening star appears. It doesn't look like what it is, gaseous particles masquerading as collective body. Yet I have seen in wooded night, St. Elmo's fire and Aurora Borealis. I have seen the solar eclipse looking for all the world like an opened eye, fathomless pupil enclosed by lavender ellipsoid iris. False colors, I suppose. I don't know the properties of light but I know the red wink of my porch bound neighbor's Corona cigar signals calm. I know blush colored rings around a bowl shaped moon mean a luminary holding water, signaling promise of cleansing rain. Thank you. My name is Mary Dahl. I'm with Cape Canaveral Penn Women and I'm in arts and letters. Claire Massey and I had never met, but we did connect via a telephone call. We tossed around some ideas. I'm an artist and a writer, so I'm happy to go with any direction in collaboration. Claire is an excellent writer, so we easily established who would do what. I had just created two pieces of art for the Orlando Science Center, a wonderful Pompeii exhibit, and at first I was leaning on borrowing from that theme. But our second conversation and a few art attempts led us to realize that it would be better for, we would be better served to decide on having a finished piece of prose or poetry or a finished piece of art and go from there. In our case, Claire's beautiful poem, Coronasphere, sparked the inspiration. 
As I read it, I could see the scene in my head. I knew that the predominant color needed to be blue, with evening's calm and her St. Elmo's fire reference, a cool color like the night. This also allowed the stark white of the moon glow to take shape and distinguish the floor around her. The woman who is living the poem sits, her back to the audience, enveloped in an Adirondack chair, but her face shows in profile, expressionless, but with enough glow from the night's main light to show contentment and promise, even as she realizes due to lockdown, she can simply be a spectator to the actions in the adjoining yard. She connects to the moon as silvery white light rests on petals and leaves that support her musings. The hint of pink complexion and the tint of red in her wine glass offer a comfortable familiarity with the scene and complete the per pervasive blues and stark whites. The moon glow gives off an aura, but invites the mistiness of the night, giving the impression that dewy moisture hangs in the air, ready to bestow its cleaning, cleansing rain. There are tiny white splatters that give the hint of stars or maybe little insects in the night. I use Daniel Smith watercolors because they are a grainy or watercolor than many. And I thought it gave an idea of the moisture in the air. White is very dominant. I don't, liking ma I don't like using masking fluid, so I used an actual liquid watercolor. It's often made used for corrections, but I thought it gave a really nice glow to the leaves. I wanna thank um, Barbara Dunham for organizing all of this and um, Carla Sorensen for hosting and Nancy Nesbitt for co-hosting. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. We will now go to team seven with Debbie Weich and Christine Salome presenting their two collaborations. Debbie? I am Debbie Weich. I'm with the Cape Canaveral Pen Women and I'm doing letters. The Kitty in the Tulips. One day while my little kitty cat underneath the tulip sat, she looked entranced by the brilliant flowers, mesmerized, whiling away the hours. Could she see the colors and smell the sweet perfume? Or did they simply soothe her just by being in the room? Was my sweet baby a connoisseur? Were those bright blossoms making her purr? Out of the corner of my eye, I caught her look. The breeze through the window was all it took to transform her from her restful state, to pounce on them, she couldn't wait. Grabbing the vase in the nick of time, just before she jumped up to climb on top of the flowers, her brand new toys, causing lots of angst and noise. Her plan was thwarted, so off she ran. To look for more mischief, that was her plan. For now, the tulips had survived the day, as Kitty thought, where there's a will, there's a way. And now I would like to present Christine Salome, who will show you the beautiful picture that prompted me to write this poetry. Christine. Thank you very much, Debbie. Le chat et les tulipes. This is a, a little uh, beautiful picture. I was inspired by Leeds Agni artist from Girl Breeze. Um, I have here uh, the little um, picture uh, of a photograph and I I did this um, aqua watercolor and pastel painting uh, because I am somebody who admire nature and I really enjoy uh, contemplating. So Debbie really described this moment the best for me and uh, I really appreciated and I was very touched by her words, le chat de tulip, the cat with the tulip flowers. So it's really uh, touching. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Christine. And the second poem I wrote is called The Ruby-Throated Bird. And when I saw the picture, I called Christine and I said, I don't know what kind of a bird this is. You. You know, and she told me the whole story about her mom and how this bird would come to her in the garden. And it was just such a beautiful story. 
And every time I read this poem, I think of your mom, even though I didn't know her. I feel like she's with me in spirit. One morning on my garden gate, a ruby-throated bird regaled me with its melodic song, the best I'd ever heard. The little thing sat there and looked me in the eye. What is it you would want from me? I asked the feathered guy. In answer to my question, he broke back into song. Need to figure this out. Hope it doesn't take too long. I went and got a feeder and hung that thing right up. He swooped over to it and started eating from the cup. He'd be there every morning. We got to be best friends. He calmed me down and made me smile. I found it very zen. One day I decided to feed him from my hand. After much cooing and coaxing, he finally took a stand. He landed on my fist as my fingers gently parted, revealing a feast, he took some and then swiftly departed. Before I knew it, he was back, singing a happy tune. On my fingers, he did land. Oh, that bird could croon. As time passed, he sat and ate, didn't feel the need to leave. He was as tame as a wild bird gets, I truly do believe. The Lord is my strength and the subject of my praise. Thank you. We know you work in mysterious ways. You sent that ruby-throated bird to sing and dance and eat. He looks straight into my eyes and his presence is a treat. Every morning the bird comes by. We make each other's day. And in my heart, his sweet, sweet song will forever stay. And here's the beautiful picture that prompted this. Thank you so much, Debbie. Uh, I'm so touched again and so grateful. Uh, my name is Christine Salome with Pensacola Branch and my um, designation are arts and letters. And you are, again, it's like you've ever lived with me. <laughs> I was so <laughs> touched. <laughs> I've never seen you and it's just thanks to this beautiful collaboration that uh, we got to uh, work together. So yes, this is from a calendar my mom uh, gave me in 2015. And uh, the, the little message, the little quote was, Le Seigneur est ma force et le sujet de mes louanges. So this is wonderful that you, you, that you wrote in English and it's so touching. And, Mm, this this little bird, I did it in watercolor, like you see. And uh, my mom always told me, Christine, yes, uh, uh, this is. I, I buy. I bought you this calendar because you can. Uh, you you will be able to draw them, and uh, so <laughs> and I'm so happy I did. And you inspired me so much by what you wrote. And also, it's amazing that you you discover that my love for birds when. I, I was in Switzerland and I put my finger in a cage, you know, for the wild animals. And I put my my finger in a little cage and one of the birds, it was a, a menat, came on, on my finger and I had a relationship with him. <laughs> so you didn't know that, but you translated it so well in your poetry. So thank you so much again. Thank you. It was a great joy. And I hope we get to collaborate again. Oh, yes, I hope too. <laughs> Thank you. Next, Team 8 will present. Uh, Pam Webb is unable to join us, so Karen Morris will present for both herself and Pam. Karen? I'm Karen Morris, a letters member of the Pensacola branch. As soon as Pam Webb and I were partnered up, we started getting to know each other through a lot of emails. She's a member of the Cape Canaveral branch, a watercolor artist of specializing in scenes of South Florida, the Bahamas, and the Caribbean. I sent her my two poetry chapbooks and I visited her website to get a feel for her art. We actually created more than um, one new work with each other, but for today we selected a poem of mine called The Heron and a painting of hers called Quiet Flight. The Heron. 
He's there again, the heron at the end of the dock where I see him when the storms come, appearing out of nowhere like a sticker a child applies or beam down like Scotty when the bayou channel is a shattered mirror so impenetrable that he must find a higher vantage point and wait until the water flattens and he can see the fish in its clear depths, staying sometimes for hours as I go about the house. From time to time, I pause at the window to watch his utter stillness until he's just no longer there. In fine weather, he stands on long hinged stem-like legs in the shallows, shadowed by leaning oak limbs, unnoticed as I tread the soft gray boards to watch for mullet springing out sideways or see if the blue crabs are clinging to the pilings. Until with a siren-like squawk, he erupts from his hiding place and flaps away, head with its daggered orange beak and reptilian eye atop the curved neck legs angled behind him, great wings beating on to another sheltering place. But for now, he's still there in the rain and wind, patient, waiting as should I, never more than now, for the right time when vision is restored, when the moment comes for the next powerful rise. Pam couldn't be here today, but here is her beautiful watercolor called Quiet Flight. What I like about the pairing of the poem and the painting is that it brings out the interesting contrast between how quiet the heron can be while it's waiting in the shallows for food, and then once in the air, air it's in the air it's quiet again. But that moment when it decides to launch itself into the air makes a horrendous noise that can stop you in your tracks. All in all, it's a beloved bird of our area, and I think the poem and the painting complement each other really well. Next, Team 9 will present Patricia Setzer and Barbara Dunham. Hello, I'm Pat Setzer, sometimes called Patricia Setzer, and I'm an artist from Jacksonville, Florida. And um, at first, I'm going to tell you a little bit that Barbara Dunham and I uh, collaborated on the art. We were pretty general. We decided that we would do a 16 by 16 me medieval painting. And um, my painting is called Eternal Ideals. Um, a writer from our branch, our president, is um, Laura Gio Brenson. And this is a poem she wrote called Life's Longing. Once upon and evermore, I am in my room. It is pure luxury. There is no strife, there is no gloom. There is only my here. There is only my now. A now where all good things are allowed. My cup overflows. I know not need, I know not how, I am safe, I am warm, I am held, I am cooed. I know only that I am, and life, life is good. Ten days before the doctor's prediction, I leave my life-giving room. Eviction, enforced past the end of a lease, is exacting work, not rooted in peace. My mother's queendom of harmonic rain, where her blood runs rhythms coursing my veins, surrenders me to the harshest of dawns in a world of bright lights and hurry redrawn with well-intentioned schism. The cord breaks, the free fall begins and clangs and bangs and pokes and prods. This kingdom of boisterous gods wins until nestled in the folds of her arm, I rediscover the charms of motherhood. Not of or from me who was nurtured beneath her rib and no longer needs her body as crib but understands that suspended in our journey, the tide is now upended, made free to flow back and forth, in and out, until coming is going, and I know without doubt that despite death's march of dribbles and drabs and memories whisked oft in demented cabs, I am loved, am worthy of love, and do love you see, in as much and because she first loved me. My painting is a mixed media piece, it's called Eternal Ideals. The wings are dimensional and the collection of writings and art had been saved for years awaiting the proper time to be revealed. The il illuminated script joined with the other elements to create Eternal Ideals. Now here is my partner, Barbara Dunham.
Hello, my name is Barbara Dunham, and I am a collage and mixed media artist. And as Pat explained, uh, she and I collaborated and uh, decided on the size and the color palette and the theme um, of the Re Italian Renaissance medieval period. Um, we decided what artist doesn't admire that period in art history. My collage is entitled Gaspara and it is inspired by the Renaissance woman poet, Gaspara Stampa. Prior to this occasion, I had purchased a book entitled Women Poets of the Italian Renaissance. When I approached the task at hand, a female poet seemed the perfect fit for this pen woman collaboration. The collage contains images of renderings by great Italian Renaissance artists, period architecture, found papers, gold leaf, and excerpts from Gaspar's po poetry. I was inspired by this poet in many ways. Her story is fascinating. And if you will allow me to share some of this story, that was the genesis of my artwork. Gaspar was born in 1523 in Padua, Italy of a Venetian mother and an impoverished Milanese nobleman who had become a jeweler. For her station, Gaspara received a good education in Latin, Greek, metrics, and music. Gaspara and her sister became famous for their singing. Then in her 20s, Gaspara began to write poetry, and her talent was widely accepted and revered. While Gaspara was successful in music and poetry, she was very unlucky in love. Much of her poetry is centered on her relationship with Count Colatino di Collado. In 1554, Gaspar's health declined and she passed at the tender, tender age of 31. Not long after her death, her sister published her poetry. Two centuries later, she was discovered again. And once more in the early 20th century, when her poems were translated into English. It was then that I purchased the aforementioned book containing both the Italian and English versions of her poems. It is said that Gaspara did in fact free herself from her obsessive love by sublimating her pain into some of the finest poetry in Italian literature. History has called her the greatest and most creative poet of the Italian Renaissance. Gaspara Stampa, a woman poet, su successful despite the odds, famous in her own time and remembered and honored 500 years later. I like to think that if pen women had existed during the Renaissance, she would have been our pen sister. Thank you. So we will proceed to team 10 uh, with Pat Patricia Daly Leip, Mara Vixnens, and Ann Bear. I'm Patricia Daly Leip, and I was president of the La Jolla branch in California. And then the DC branch, I was president. And we moved to Florida two and a half years ago, and I joined the Jacksonville branch. Um, I'm a member of Letters, however, I'm also an artist, and um, if you go to literarylady.com, you can spy on me, and uh, this all began because uh, I think uh, we have a, uh, three of us are interested in France, and we, in the front of my book, uh, can you see? Myth, Magic, and Metaphor, I have a picture, a painting I did of the princess and the unicorn which was the beginning of our co co collaboration. So uh, the choice that Anne thought I should use would be one of my poems was had to do with when I was in Provence and I was painting in Provence. And I wrote about where I was staying, which was in Lacoste. And the poem goes, Les Pierres de Lacoste, a tapestry of stone, texture, tone, contrast, converging and conveying, Linear patterns, cool and warm, light dancing upon and between, rough and smooth, cut, split, dusty. Conflict tends to connect the intimacy of hate, the tension of love. Stones everywhere, above, below, between, cobblestones weaving through centuries as generations stumble, defense, design, fortress, home. Hurry up now. It's time. It's time. Stoically, the tapestry of stone stands still. 
And the paintings we put as a collage of three uh, should be shown together. Um, and I need to introduce you then to one of our members, which is Mara Vixnins. So she needs, Mara needs to be come up next and then you will see that all of our paintings, a collage. Good so afternoon. I'm Mara Vixnins, Art, Pensacola, Florida branch. Uh, I feel very honored to be part of this collaboration. Uh, for me, it was magical. I did not plan to collaborate with uh, anybody in any other branch uh, because when at the time I was not in uh, good shape. I had no inspiration. I was not painting. I had lost my husband not long ago and the COVID crisis had just overwhelmed me. So uh, I wasn't really, um, I didn't feel worthwhile to collaborate with anybody. I got a call from Ann Bear, my good friend for years, and she told me about Patricia and medieval folk tales and her book, and also about her painting, The Princess and the Unicorn. The painting is beautiful, Patricia. I absolutely love it. And I am so excited to be part of this. Uh, I have also purchased your book, Myth, Magic, and Metaphor. And it is also very inspiring. So after seeing Patricia's painting and listening to Anne's story and the collaboration that they came up with and the tapestries that uh, they both own, which Anne will tell you about, and also their love of France, which I also have, uh, I was suddenly inspired. I got off the phone with Anne and I went to my studio got out a canvas and just started painting and painted the characters uh, that were in the medieval folk tale. And before you know it, this imagery arrived. I didn't have to stress over it. Uh, sometimes when I'm painting, uh, you know, you get bogged down and you uh, start second guessing yourself. Uh, I also have a experience with uh, Greek mythology and women in nature. Those are my themes that run throughout my work and this fit right in with that. So I want to thank Pat, Patricia and Anne for including me in this wonderful collaboration. Uh, it has led to more inspiration and I am so excited to be part of it. I'd like to now introduce Anne, who will continue the saga. My name is Anne Baer. I'm vice president and historian of our Pensacola branch. I've been an art member for 11 years. Photography and making videos uh, are my passion. This collaboration was so much fun and meaningful by discovering a common link that we shared. We brought history into the present with our artistic creations by combining our fascination with the Middle Ages and folklore, our own experiences in France, and our connections with the tapestries. It was the perfect combination for our collaboration. I hope you enjoy my three minute video that unravels our story. Thanks.
Thank you so much, Anne. And now we will have closing comments by Barbara Dunham. Ladies, um, I am overwhelmed by the quality and uh, the beautiful work that you've done. Thank you so much. Um, this will live for a long time. Um, in the words of Louisa May Alcott, it takes two pieces of flint to make a fire. This may not always be true, but the artists and writers who have shared their work with us today have not only inspired each other, but have inspired us. I hope the collaboration experience will long remain a pleasant memory and a source of pride. We thank them so much for their talent, creativity, and willingness to participate. Thank you.